Hi. So anybody that wants to discuss politics in the West in the year 2021 knows the fighting and losing battle. We all know that politicians, especially on the national level, don't really represent anyone other than their own special interests. We've always known that, but I don't think people understand why. And, and because people don't understand why, we're getting to the point where politics has become not just a distraction, but a divisive force within society. And the reason that politicians represent special interests is number one, the shift from government running on taxes from people like you and me to debt and loans. Number two, the shift from relying on taxes to fund services to debt that is in most cases global and therefore requires heavy security, especially military cooperation, especially naval cooperation. So in a sense, the reduction of the individual's political agency has been driven by a naval-based global trade scheme in which banks run the show. And the consequences of that have been not only this backlash against globalization, but a backlash against immigration and anything foreign in some parts of society. To the extent that people don't really understand that globalization and immigration have always been with us. And it's simply that there's been more concentration of power than ever before. So the issue has never been globalization, which has always been around. Trade has always been around. The people in this country, the United States, when they would open a business, they opened a business to trade with Europe. They had to ship that cotton, that sugar. It didn't, didn't matter if you're in the United States or anywhere in the Caribbean, you were shipping using the sea somewhere else. We haven't even mentioned slavery. The slave, slave trade was obviously <laughs> transatlantic. Again, a system that depended on naval prowess within a globalized trading scheme. But let's get back to politics. So we know that the current president of the United States, Joseph Biden, he tried to run for president two other times, didn't work, and finally made it on the third time. He's obviously not the only one. Before Donald Trump, a billionaire, you had Michael Bloomberg, a billionaire, running for office. Uh, he switched parties, used to be, I mean, I, I can't even remember what he is now. But you can also see that the party designation doesn't really mean anything. Uh, Elizabeth Warren used to be a Republican. She's now a Democrat. Hillary Clinton used to be a Republican. She supported Goldwater. She worked on Goldwater's campaign. And then she became a Democrat. Um, Donald Trump has contributed to both the Democrats and to the Republican Party base over the years. So before Michael Bloomberg, you've got Ross Perot. And he might have been the most effective billionaire who ran for office because he really did change the game. He had to be taken seriously. Because first of all, his ideas were correct. And second of all, he did appear to be sincere and quite frankly, extremely intelligent in a way that wasn't condescending. So we go back and we look at even people that haven't been trying to run for election three times or for the most part copies of the interests that have been backing them up for decades and in some cases centuries. In the United States, we know that we have a serious problem with concentration of ownership, especially with respect to real estate. We know that in the United States, that concentration of ownership was based on the transatlantic slave trade that was supported by the Catholic Church in Spain as well as just trade between Europe and the United States in, in everything, not just slaves. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, right here where I am, the city has a Spanish name. An hour north of me in one of the financial centers, 
of the West Coast is San Francisco, a Spanish name. It was a joke that I heard that somebody was speaking Spanish to his friend in San Diego and an older lady uh, accosted him, accosted him and demanded that he speak English. And his response was, how do you say San Diego in English? So we traced all these things back and it's not only this, the old adage that behind every fortune, behind every great fortune is a great crime. There's this idea that the cultural system or the cultural progress that was underpinning a concentration of financial wealth and a concentration of business ownership and a concentration of political power is failing. And as a result, we're not able to create or at least move up the chain of human cultural progress. And that's one of the reasons why in many countries that are considered to be developed, those countries tend to have a higher suicide rate than so-called developing countries. They tend to be more isolated. They tend to be cultural copies of former colonizers in some cases. And there's a sense that these systems that have been in place for centuries are failing. So we, we right off the bat, we understand it's not a Biden issue. It's not a Trump issue. It's really just a political issue that deals with concentration of power and the desire to hold on to that power. And in order to hold on to that power, you have to, in many cases, corrupt the social institutions that underpin your country. That would include the educational system. That would include the social welfare system, which in most Western countries is essentially privatized. In other words, it's run by nonprofits associated with religious entities. Um, you go all the way back and forth and you see this strange governmental model where the government itself doesn't really handle welfare. It outsources it to religious entities thereby reserving for itself a role in the protection racket. In other words, the military and the police. And in fact, what is the largest expenditure at the national level in the United States? It is military. When you include appropriations on the city level, what is the largest line item or even just over, you know, percentage of spending is public safety, which includes firefighters and police officers. That, of course, dovetails with this idea of moving away from individual taxation and growth in a sustainable manner into a debt-fueled economic bubble, which we've seen before in 2008 and 2009. That, of course, was a real estate bubble. And the question now is whether or not we're looking at multiple bubbles at the same time that have been inflated in order to maintain the concentration of power that we're at this point used to. But back to my point, why is it that the political structure is failing on a cultural level and consequently has resulted in fragmentation, both in terms of information and in terms of obviously culture? What is, what, is, what is really going on? And the answer to that is security. You don't want a situation where if the head of an organization, whether it's the executive branch in a government, whether it's a corporate CEO, you do not want a situation where if one person from your organization is taken out, removed by force, or captured, you do not want a situation where the entire organization collapses. And so as a result, political and quite frankly, corporate CEOs have become nothing more than just figureheads. And the example I like to give when teaching this, this idea is remember in the East, that we used to have this idea of reincarnation. We still have this idea of reincarnation. And so as a result, you would have a child becoming a, not the president, I don't know the correct term, uh, the leader of a Buddhist-led country. And the reason for that, obviously, is again, who's really running the show? 
it's the military. The military's job is to protect the child and fund the system in which the child is educated in a way that allows that child, who is also being supported by marketing dollars, recruiting dollars, and so on, to, to create ideas or to, or to disseminate ideas that are favorable to the concentration of power that is, in, that is in place. In other words, to the status quo. And so that's a very simple example. There's no other reason for, you know, a child Buddha to be the leader of a country unless what I just said is true. That really it's a test of your security systems. And the people who are really running the show are branched out and diversified in a way that prevents the single head of the organization from dictating future outcomes. We know right off the bat, if you just think about the mafia, why is it so hard to take out the mafia? Despite the fact that there has been almost unlimited funding uh, against the mafia. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of the criminal legal abuses that we see in this country uh, are, are from prosecutorial discretion and laws that were made increasingly overbroad in order to trap the mafia because of the system that I just talked about, because of this organizational system that I just talked about, which is even if you take out Al Capone, his organization still does well. Even if you take out the head, the head of an Italian mafia family in New York, the organization still continues because it's based on a centuries old globalized trading system. And the person that you're able to see doesn't really run anything. It's really a test of security and, an, and a way to disseminate information to that person's followers. It's not a coincidence that we have social media. You can follow people, followers. With respect to the Buddha, the, the child Buddha, or the reincarnation, you've got this idea that religion has been around longer than governments. And in fact, that would make sense also why in many Western countries, religious entities are probably more powerful than governments, especially on a local level. In some cases, because they bought up all the land before governments were really in existence, especially in the sense of democratic governments, which have only been around post the French Revolution in the West. And of course, what was the French Revolution? That was an anti-Catholic revolution. It was something that broke apart the concentration of power, both in terms of property and leadership in what was at the time Catholic dominant, dominant and Catholic one French territory. And remember that even Napoleon eventually lost. And Napoleon was perhaps the greatest military commander in the history of the world. He made the same mistake that the Germans made uh, in that he really only lost when he tried to invade uh, Russia. Now, overall, you see that even when you have somebody who is extremely intelligent and somebody who does actually say that he's going to fight on behalf of the little guy by moving into a more simple legal code, in other words, replacing the old code with either a Napoleonic code that is more simple or something that is more straightforward and less complex, you know, with respect to, you know, literally this guy's, you know, the, what, 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 is, what is the French motto? It's, it's part of it involves egalitarianism. And of course, all of that has qualifiers, right? Um, but we know the French were more enlightened than the Spanish because on the one hand, if you go back, if you look at any French territory, you don't see the kind of breeding of slaves that existed under Spanish rule. And of course, the word Negro comes from the Spanish word Negro. So when the Catholic Spaniards showed up, they literally didn't see people from Africa as anything other than a color. And of course, there's not a French word for that, right? You go into French, even on the same continent or on the same landmass, you've got Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The, despite being presumably from similar areas, you've got a situation where the Haitians are skinny, slender, and therefore obviously not 
bled in a way that was designed to maximize crop output. Again, whether it was sugar, tobacco, and, and cotton. You go into the Dominican Republic, you've got much bigger people. Go into Cuba. What's Cuba? What's, what's the language there? It's Spanish. Go into Cuba. You've got very big Africans. They don't look, if you just take away the human eyes, unfortunate, uh, unfortunate predilection to notice colors, you wouldn't even think that the people in the Dominican Republic were related to the people in the Haitian side. Part of that has to do, by the way, with, with the Haitian revolution. And, but again, you can't have a revolution if you have, well, I suppose you could have a revolution if you have a security state. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the fact is that the French were probably more enlightened than the Spanish. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why they left. They sought the United States. Slave, New Orleans was a major trading port. Let me just pass over here. So New Orleans was a major trading point. And of course, New Orleans has a French Quarter. You go all over the world, there's always a Chinatown in the French Quarter. And, you know, whether it's in Vietnam and so on and so forth. Now, with respect to the French, they stole the Louisiana Territory to the United States because they wanted to focus on Mexico. They thought that Mexico had a much better climate. It did. And was much it's just a much better place. And quite frankly, they were right. <laughs> if you go to Mexico, the climate is better. Uh, we get our avocados from Mexico. The best ones are from Mexico. The climate uh, uh, also isn't just favorable for living. It's also favorable for farming. They didn't know it at the, at the time, but Mexico also had a lot of oil. And so you go back and forth and you look at these movements going back and forth. But the point of Napoleon is that even when you have somebody as popular and enlightened as him, he keeps makes the same mistakes as a lot of other people do, despite having incredible military prowess and knowledge. But also that even when he single-handedly, I shouldn't say that, right? The whole point is that there's nothing that happens single-handedly. Even when he removed his team, removed what was an elitist structure even then, the Notre Dame is still there. It's still in Paris. It's still something that we see. And that tells you that the media, the people that influence politics, that tells you that they may have never really changed either. And there's always been this idea that whoever, is, whoever has political power tends to control the media and vice versa, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to go succeed politically. And quite frankly, there's no way to study European history and American history without criticizing the Catholic Church. And so you can see why the Catholic Church has had to set up separate structures to promote itself. And in fact, none of, none of the founders of this country, the United States, were Catholic. The Catholic Church was banned in New York City, the idea being that it wasn't really a religion, it was more of a political movement founded on nepotism, based on a global trading system. So in other words, the Roman Empire diminished in Italy, but hey, you still have a lot of churches over there, right? It then moved up to Germany, it caused a, the Protestant Re Reformation in Germany, protest tense, protesting the Catholics, and then, after the Protestants kicked out the Catholics to the United States, the, it, it, at that point, you had a situation where the United States, uh, the Protestants, the, the Catholics kicked out the Protestants from Europe, and then the Protestants, and, and then you just had going sort of going back and forth, and the Protestants took power and then kicked out the Catholics, and everyone came to the United States, and that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why the majority ethnic class here in the United States is German, right? Where did the Protestant Reformation take place? It took place in Germany. Where is the one location in the world 
that has caused or been subject to power, power infighting and exfighting. Germany, right? Not just the not just the Protestant Reformation, you also have civil wars in the 1800s. Uh, I believe it was 1838. Uh, you, of course, then you had World War I and World War II. And of course, you can see why Germany is such a, an important piece of the puzzle. It is obviously advanced in terms of technology. At the time of World War II, it was number one in math and science. So once again, where do you get those investments uh, in technology and science? A lot of them, of course, come from military spending that in many cases is either unaccountable or hidden. And that, of course, explains why in military dictatorships, there has always been a hostility towards journalism and therefore the truth. Because when you're spending money in a way that is unsustainable we don't want journalists poking around that's true again of corporations whether it's enron or something else you really do not want a situation where <laughs> you know you're in a position where you have to answer to the people because you're not you're not really living in a democratic system once your structure is based on debt you're running you're living and running a governmental system that is going to be based on either unsustainable inflation and uneven inflation that will eventually lead to conflict in a way that forces the banking system to play along with the existing power structure in order to maintain its own licenses, in order to maintain its own power. So banks, remember, are backstopped by the government. And so that's where you have FDIC insurance and so on and so forth. And so it's a mistake to think of banks as separate from as separate from governments in almost every western system the banking system and the governmental system are partners that is of course in contrast to the communist system which was based on essentially the agricultural sector and the construction sector the blue collar sector the hammer construction the sickle the farming sector disdaining the banking elites and therefore the academics that were funded by the, by the banking elites. So overall, you see the real difference between the East and the West has been this and how to use debt and how much influence does the central government give not only to distant local governments, but also to the global banking sector. So what are politicians? Politicians are essentially stand-ins for an economic alliance based on globalized trade that goes back centuries that is in partnership with both private and public banks and as well as, well as hedge funds in order to move on to the next level of scientific and technological advancement that will also allow the existing power brokers to maintain their own fiefdoms. Unfortunately, when you don't have this sort of progress in a way that lifts all the tides together in a cohesive way, you have fragmentation. And that fragmentation oftentimes, though not always, leads to a kind of a civil conflict. So the key issue here is understanding economics so that you can understand politics. And once you realize that you really do have to understand economics and politics in order to understand history, it becomes extremely complex. And then the question is, what do you do about it? Obviously, we're in a position where the tax code favors existing power, because remember who makes the laws? It's the people that get the politicians elected. Who gets the politicians elected? It's special interests. And it wasn't necessarily a problem when it wasn't necessarily a problem as much in the past when you really could save money, put a down payment on a home, and move up to another class. It's now a problem because of, of inflation. We just talked about inflation, right? How do governments maintain power? They oftentimes do it by inflating assets that they control. 
And if they do it poorly, there's a bubble that bursts at some point. Now, with respect to politics, we're now dealing with a billion dollar game that is, that is used to support a trillion dollar infrastructure. Um, and again, it goes back to security. Just one bank, JP Morgan, which rose to power post-World War II, based on a, the guy with the last name of Morgan. By the way, even the Mormons, right? The last name Young, it's not just Smith, right? It's the last name Young oftentimes, though not always, uh, is associated with Mormons. And so the two primary people post-World War II that were controlling the terms and conditions of trade uh, between the defeated and the victors were two men. One of them was called Morgan and another one was called Young. So <laughs> it also makes sense that the Mormons might, would be part of that structure because of their, I'm not gonna say military style conservatism, uh, but you know, you can't have a beard. If you, if you go to BYU, you have to be clean shaven. You can't have piercings. Um, you know, these are all, your, your hair has to be cut short. But these are all, what, what do they remind you of, right? They remind you of the same code of conduct within the military. Um, and that's all designed to maximize a, a kind of, I suppose a kind of culture, at least in the past, uh, that would be, that would promote it would promote, I'm not going to say economic output, it would just promote a culture that would be in contrast to, say, the freewheeling drunk Catholics um, that had their Mardi Gras. You know, you notice the Mormons don't really have a Mardi Gras. Uh, you look at the Protestants again, I don't know, I don't know what the Protestants, I don't know what their festivals are, but again, they're also, you know, the whole the idea of a Protestant is in opposition to the Catholic Church. And so, you know, as a result, I don't think the Protestants would have the sort of freewheeling type of events or, or festivals, at least not in the past, uh, compared to the Catholics. And so you can see how post-World War II, you had this idea, well, we're not going to smoke, we're not going to drink. And this makes us good partners for a banking system that is really, in essence, an insurance system. And when you think about an insurance agent, you know, you probably want to want to think about a Mormon. Um, the Mormons, not necessarily the blonde hair, blue eyed, tie wearing Mormons that you see, uh, but really just a culture that prioritizes something other than a freewheeling, you know, sort of bubble that a lot of countries have been known for. And that actually has a lot to do with why we have these systems in place. We have them because money is really designed to promote a type of culture. If you have the money, you can dictate the culture. And what does that mean? In the past, remember that the religious entities have been the ones that have been battling, not just over land, but over the terms and conditions of legal systems and globalized trade, all of which, when taken together, create a kind of a culture. And so when we think about a society that's run by banks, and also insurance companies like Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. You are really looking at a system in place where the religions that have been successful have oftentimes been based on security. So JP Morgan, what I just mentioned, is uh, now spending $700 million a year just on digital security. Overall, in terms of digital advancements, digital um, investments on infrastructure is spending $10 billion a year based on an interview I saw with uh, Jamie Demon. Um, and so obviously you have a, a problem now because if it takes $10 billion a year to get into the banking sector, obviously you're going to have a concentration of ownership. Obviously antitrust is going to be diminished. Obviously you're going to have a problem in terms of how to advance people in diverse societies when you have such a concentration of ownership in the West that goes all the way back to the Crusades, perhaps, uh, all the way back to civil wars in Europe, especially in Germany, all the way back to the transatlantic slave trade, all the way back to this idea of the Protestants and the Catholics creating their own separate spheres of influence within the United States.
with the Catholics being forced to do so, because after the Protestants kicked them out of Europe, they came to the United States and they had to operate in secret because in many places they were banned. In some communities in the United States, there were Protestants. Uh, the KKK was not actually anti-black, it was anti-Catholic. And that's where the anti-immigration came from. You see all these cartoons of that really mock the whoever whoever was gaining power at the time. And you know, you can see that you know, again there's an overlap between the media and political power. Who controls the media oftentimes controls political political structure, as I just said. Well, why is that important? It's important because remember if it costs you $20 billion to protect your assets within a system that was designed post-World War II under terms and conditions that were dictated essentially by two banks, one of which is now the, the one I just talked about, the idea of diversity, real diversity, is problematic. And in fact, we've talked about that before. Diversity in the United States doesn't really, despite our predilection for the visual, not just in terms of color, but otherwise, it doesn't really exist in a meaningful way. Because a lot of the immigrants to the United States have been refugees of wars um, or civil wars. In other words, they've had to come here. And so you look at the community of San Jose, there are a lot of Asians here, but they're not Chinese. They're either from South Korea, which we have a, an important trading relationship with, Taiwan, an important trading relationship with, Hong Kong, not really Hong Kong, right? They, they would be in, in the UK or somewhere in Europe. Um, you go back and forth. You don't really have anybody from mainland China here. And we do have, you know, again, obviously Japan, uh, the Japanese in World War II, some of them went back, but a lot of them stayed because they had children here. And those children didn't necessarily speak Japanese fluently. Uh, and so if you did go back, you were kind of stuck. And there might, you know, remember that Japan post-World War II was, may not have been the kind of place that you, you would want to live. There was an amazing, uh, not a cartoon, but animation feature uh, that came out that purports to tell the story of Yoko Ono and her protection of her brother growing up. And things were so desperate in post-World War II in Japan that, <laughs> well, you've got to see this documentary. I believe it's... It's got the word fireflies in it. If you just Google Japanese animation, um, World War II fireflies, you'll probably see it. But it really is supposed to be based on the experience of Yoko Ono, who of course was really the one behind a lot of John Lennon's lyrics. She was the one helping him write a lot of his songs. You can see where, you can see how, you know, where she would get the inspiration for such meaningful and offbeat, in a sense, uh, creativity. But in any case, back to the banking sector, right? So you've got this idea where, you know, the immigration system in, in this country, again, Japanese, they couldn't go back or, did, or they really didn't have a choice. They had to stay in the United States. The Vietnamese, the United States lost the Vietnam War. The, the Vietnamese people you see here had to be brought back because otherwise they would have been murdered uh, in some cases by the existing power uh, who won the war. And so, you're not looking at really a voluntary system of, Im of immigration at any point in human history, at any point. So the diversity that you're seeing is really based on, you know, something that is artificial and the consequence of total failure. And the hostility that you see to immigration is based on these power structures that have been in place going back and forth for centuries. And again, even if the KKK, remember in some places like Iowa was anti-Catholic, you can see right off the bat that you know, immigration is sort of a proxy for power and the ability to tell your story. Because if you're trying to stay speak badly of China, it's a, lot, it's a lot easier to convince people that China is the enemy if you don't have a Chinese neighbor next door. If you have only a Taiwanese neighbor next door or somebody from Hong Kong next door that's been kicked out of the country. And therefore we'll tell you the story that will support the military investments that we just talked about. So when you sort of reverse engineer the chain of events, of events in human history, the diversity in this country and all over the world has not been voluntary. It just looks that way because the human eye, again, just goes on the visual, negro, black. It doesn't, it's, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to move away from the visual. 
takes a lot of experience, a lot of travel. We talked about how religion, religion and military overlapped. Obviously, the Crusades were ordered by a pope. Uh, we, but, you know, look at, say, the Islamic religion. Why do you pray five times a day? A lot of it is going to be facilitating the lookouts, right? It's trying to help the soldiers who are in lookout positions on the towers that surround most mosques, called minarets. And so you've got the minarets. Those are essentially lookout towers. Yes, we know them as places where um, Im Im imams issue the call to prayer, but you can easily see how an imam would be in the minaret issuing the call for prayer on a system that was designed as an emergency warning system to get people out of, say, the market, the bazaar, and into a safer area, allowing the military to defend the fort. You can see how all that would make sense. And so, oh, by the way, Medina just means city. Uh, but of course, the Muslims separated the commercial center from the military, in part because of that call to prayer that was an emergency warning system that would uh, allow people within the civilian sector to retreat into areas of safety in a fort system. And, you know, you've got the castles. If you're Christian, you've got a similar setup. It's a castle. And then, of course, you have all the weapons that were designed to infiltrate both of, the, both of those structures within the Islamic religion. Again, just like Napoleon, you know, the idea was to focus on an army that was a voluntary army that wanted to join you on the foundation of equality. So my Prophet Muhammad came up. He was an orphan. And so he happened to be you know, despite being part of the elite familial structure of merchants, he obviously as an orphan was more, was almost destined to be compassionate towards the poor. So the first thing he does is become anti-slavery. He then creates a religious system that is attractive to military recruits from all colors and all races because you could not be Muslim and be a slave. And so... As a result, you, in order to maintain that social cohesion, you had to wake up five times a day. You had to pray together five times a day in the same place. You had the same system of separating the genders, separating the sexes, in order to maintain a kind of military-style structure. That, of course, was helpful towards establishing an economic system that was not based on a bubble-type system. It was, it was in contrast to a bubble-type system. When we talk about the East and the West. What you're really talking about are banks. How do you use debt? How do you grow the economy? Do you grow it through an ownership structure under Sharia? Do you grow it towards or something else? Or do you grow it to, you know, through a system of NFTs and a security-based system that, for the most part, seeks to, seeks to use inflation as a way to maintain power? and therefore is destined for crashes as well as uh, as well as greater growth opportunities in the short term so so again you've got this muslim system that was you know that probably was a precursor to the french system and what was interesting of course is napoleon understood the islamic system very well he, and you know when he went to egypt he actually said that you know, he was, I believe that he, he had a vision from, I don't know if he said Allah, but he had a vision basically that, you know, he, that he would be there and so on and so forth. It was designed to, again, create a system that was going to be able to attract the most number of recruits voluntarily, the same way the Islamic system, in order to get away from slavery. Uh, in, you know, you obviously had a system where you had to fulfill essentially a boot camp system that brought people together, regardless of religion. So in the United States, you know, you notice that a lot of people are pro-military. Uh, I, of course, am anti-war. My hero is Muhammad Ali, which is odd, right? Because the Nation of Islam is a paramilitary structure. It's a paramilitary organization. It, ex it came into power by providing security in cities and urban areas in the United States where the police just wouldn't protect. So Muhammad Ali, of course, is anti-war, anti-Vietnam war. Uh, and so, you know, you have this, it's not a coincidence that when you study history, that you become, in a sense, if you're black, predispositioned to moving towards Islam rather than, say, Catholicism, which, of course, explains why 
there is so much pro-Catholic propaganda and marketing in Western countries that are diverse, right? Well, every Western country is in a sense diverse because it was dependent on black slaves at one point in time. A problem that less diverse societies don't necessarily have unless they were forced to be diverse through British colonialism, European colonialism, where the police force would be shipped out from somewhere else to, to control the local population. Um, you know, whether it was a private company like the British East India Company, or it was just, you know, say you had a need for Chinese labor, you would segregate the Chinese somewhere in Malaysia. And, you know, that would be a system in place where of a separate but equal system where the Chinese uh, would control that area and it was a win-win situation. Uh, but of course, that also is a precursor to the American system of separate but equal. The entire diversity that we see is really based on a lie. It's because everything post-World War II has been based on an idea of separate but equal, which of course is an oxymoron. And <laughs> we know, by the way, that this system does not exist in Islamic countries because uh, you go to Northern Africa, you see colors there, as I've said in the past, that you've never, that I've never seen before. You won't see anywhere in Western countries, at least not yet. If anybody is smart, they're going to try to do the best they can to attract as many Africans as they possibly can. Obama's father was, of course, from Africa, and so on and so forth. So you look at a an overall situation where you're looking at governance as a way to distribute money in order to maintain power, in order to facilitate cultural progress. And the problem with the 21st century is that we kind of missed out on, on the last part. We've got a lot of progress, a lot of scientific progress, a lot of engineering progress, but not so much cultural progress because all of our history, all of our understanding of it has been funded by marketers and banks desperate to hold on to power and real estate developers and real estate owners desperate to hold on to their possessions. Because remember, the Catholic Church has oftentimes had its property confiscated. And in many cases, it got it back as a way to promote social cohesion. And so you see why you have this idea of a lie, of history being based on not just one lie, but many lies. Hitler, by the way, was raised Catholic. I'm not trying to pick on the Catholic Church. It's just that historically, you can't study European history and Western history without understanding that the Catholic Church in the past was perhaps the most intolerant system, political system in European history, which is why you have so many offshoots and, and, and fragmentation within Christianity. So, of course, that, that may be changing now, but even Donald Trump kissed the Pope, Pope's ring. Um, so we'll see, right? Because, you know, which obviously makes sense. Well, how did Donald Trump make his money? Global real estate. So you have to understand why do we have money? Remember that last part I just talked about is for eventually is for cultural progress. And eventually it's to create a system of voluntary conscription into a law and order system that maintains security in a way that, that also promotes creativity. That's basically it. When the cost of doing that goes up to <laughs> billions of dollars a year, just for one bank, and trillions of dollars for countries, you've got a limitation on human progress. That's what we're looking at now. One of the reasons that the police have been maligned is because they just don't have the money anymore to compete in the propaganda wars. If you're competing on a local level in a finite budget and you're up against essentially a, a unaccountable national entity, you're going to lose influence. That's just the way it's going to be. And that's what's happened in the United States. It appears the military and the military recruiting budget, the military marketing budget, it appears that all of these things are now being used to move into a centralized and more centralized government. And this, of course, is another reason why we are, we've had so many issues in the United States. Over the last, since 2001, 
when China joined the WTO, China has become a capitalist country. It's using debt. Of course, it's a net creditor to the United States. So it's using debt more wisely. Um, but, you know, you've got this idea of the United States becoming more socialist over time, becoming an economy where success is based on pre-existing governmental connections rather than merit. I don't know if, if people who are against socialism, against communism, in many cases, they're trying to promote a system that's based on merit as opposed to who you know and who and whether it's a banker or a politician. And so, you know, you look at all these different things and another reason that we're having so much anti-China propaganda is because it's probably at this point in time, the Chinese are more capitalistic than the United States, uh, a centralized government within an era of multiple technological standards is probably a better form of government in terms of stability than a decentralized government like the United States system, which is extremely complex. And that's the other reason why the United States is having so many problems. And let's quickly try to cover that and then end on that. Remember that you're trying to use the money in the banking system and the economic growth to promote a culture that is based on a rule of law, that is based on security, that promotes creativity. And how do you do that? You do that by legal system, which means you do it through lawyers. And you know, you, there's no question the lawyers in the United States are totally corrupt. And obviously there's also no question that people in Congress are for the most part lawyers. There's no question that the Americans, American voters are fed up with it. And, they, and, and every time the lawyers get out of hand, a, business, a businessman is elected, whether it's, or at least supported. And, you know, sort of goes back and forth. The lawyers get out of hand, the business people come in and chop up, chop up what the lawyers have done. But it doesn't change the fact that you know, when you're talking about a society that is that really promotes diversity, it is an, extremely difficult to do that in a triple layer of regulation system. And the United States, of course, famously has a decentralized system, which means that, you know, you, you have national, state, local, and, you know, rules and regulations, in some cases, local, overlapping both in terms of county and city. So you've got four layers of government within the United States. You can see how that would also, in some cases, require, or not require, but lead to four levels of technological standards. So one software program might, you know, you just make it simple. One software program might have been designed for Microsoft on the city level, but you know, the county got a better deal from Apple, and so it's on a different system, and then the state got a better deal from Google, and so it's on an Android system. And none of them, none of these platforms have talk to each other properly or seamlessly. Whereas if you're in China, you want to roll out a digital currency to all of your citizens, you've got one standard that you control and as a result are able to get there faster rather than navigating this extremely complex system. But that's not really what the issue is with a multi-layered level of government. The issue is when you have four levels, levels of government, you have to have four, you have to be four times as honest as a competing system that is based on a single standard. And so every country that's had a single standard type of government, whether it's Singapore or China or even Russia, has been wildly successful post-2001. And uh, not a coincidence. Technology goes up, becomes a vital part of our lives, and here we are. Now, the real issue with this is that when you have such a complex system within an educational system that has been lying to the American people, within a marketing system that has been lying to the American people. The problem is that you almost, in a sense, facilitate segregation. Because how do you just imagine a situation where you have a judge that has to make a credibility determination? And you've got a Catholic judge in front of a Protestant you know, prosecutor who is prosecuting a, I don't know, a Jehovah's, I mean, a Muslim, okay? And it's a he said, she said situation where, you know, you almost want surveillance now if you're a minority because if you don't have it, then in a he said, she said situation where you're the minority, things might probably won't work out for you. 
you really have to have that documentation, which always, which eventually ends up in a catch-22 because if you are overly critical of the system, that same surveillance that can be used to protect you in the event of a judicial de determination can easily find you and ship you off to a camp uh, if times get bad enough. So that's another reason why diversity and, and minority rights have stalled within, a, within an era where governments and technological actors have, are still struggling to come up with a balanced system of human rights, of minority rights, and of efficiency and the efficient rollout of government programs, many of which are based on military surveillance and, the, and software that is designed uh, to promote certain types of ideas um, and therefore governance systems. So you, you, if you look at how complex the system is within a failing educational system within the United States, my point is that we obviously don't have four levels of government that are honest. We obviously don't even have four levels of government that are competent, in part because of technological standards, right? If you control the city council, the vendor that gives you the software for your court system, not your court system, but say the police system, police department, is, is going to be affiliated in part probably with you know, whoever is in charge of the city council, who somebody who knows somebody. Uh, even if you have on the federal level, even on the state level, if you have a, a request for proposal system, you can always figure out how to game those systems. That's where the lawyers come in. The lawyers come in because they, they know how to game the system. And they've done it too well. And when you have a complex system of government where the lawyers are not behaving in a way that's honest, societal cohesion is impossible. Because a, a government this complex... What ends up happening, especially with something like COVID, the pandemic, especially in a country with three different levels of government, you can see how, number one, China is open for business, um, you know, because, again, if you have a single standard, if you have a way of controlling a population of shutting down a city uh, un under the auspices of the central government, which can probably pay out something in order to make it palatable, uh, feasible for the people within that area, you go back and forth, things get done quickly. And in a pandemic, efficiency is key. Um, sorry, well, efficiency and also just reaction time is key. Obviously, the centralized government works better for that situation. Um, and so you look at the United States, if you look at all the different sorts of regulations, the enforcement of it, all of it is random. It's not consistent. That gives rise within a diverse society to charges of discrimination. If you include concentration of ownership within that structure of discrimination, you've got a powder keg just waiting to explode. And that's what we have and we're having right now. Now, the problem, of course, let me give you an example. I went to a farmer's market a couple of miles from here, and there was a sign that said something about, you know, you have to wear a mask at this outdoors farmer's market <clears throat> mandate of the county. <clears throat> now, it turns out that you don't, actually. The sign is from, you know, last year. Uh, rules have been relaxed for outdoors activities. The sign is still there. Somebody from there told me they wear a mask. Um, again, not proper. But they're just following orders, in a sense. <sighs> and I talked to the manager. Right, You want to move up a level to see if the higher levels have some idea of what's going on. Well, the managers just gave me a song and dance about how they made a city, a contract with the city to open up. And the sign just says county because they failed to update the sign. And so even though it should stay mandated the city, uh, it says county. That's actually not true. It sounds great, but it's not true. Uh, it's not true because the county is the one that dictates, has health, the county has a health department. Cities don't have health departments. Remember, what, what are cities? The cities basically are public safety agencies plus water management. That's basically it. Um, those favors real estate development, right? That's the whole idea. The cops protect the property. You have economic growth. You've got to have water to expand real estate, especially if you want to build a massive shopping mall or a hotel, so on and so forth. That's really what cities are all about. Uh, the counties are places that haven't been developed yet. So the county gets first crack at those places. 
because we probably have a different system if you have mainly farmers in agricultural areas uh, and you know you, do, you don't want some you know city patrol uh, <laughs> city slicker coming in and telling farmers what to do you want somebody that's more attuned to rural, you know less populated areas um, this all makes sense on paper right but not if you have a failing educational system and you know a, a system of teaching that recruits teachers based on union uh, governmental union affiliations you end up having a homogenous structure at that point that makes it a lot easier to uh, promote fake news and the reason for fake news is to, is to again promote the status quo which you benefit from and the benefits are not just maintaining power but attracting investments attracting uh, you know, you have to keep it going, right? Someone's got to pay that interest. Someone's got to buy that house at a higher price. <clears throat> so the propaganda and the marketing is all for a very logical reason. But with respect to the farmer's market situation, there was again a situation where you had somebody that was a manager, a very smart man, wasn't trying to lie to me, just didn't understand what was going on. And, didn't, and therefore, didn't even understand his own government. Because again, the county is the one that comes up now. A lot of the rules are from the state. Those are all workplace rules. So the state uh, has, you know, not just OSHA, not, not just a workplace safety organization. It has a workplace labor organization, uh, agency. Uh, they, would, they would be the ones that dictate to, to the employer to protect the employees. But that has nothing to do with a customer walking into a farmer's market. In order for me to know that, I have to have studied law. But you notice how if somebody is not as magnanimous as me, I don't, I don't call myself, and my, by, by the way, I'm not very compassionate at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think if you have to favor a system of duty over compassion, I think that would be the one that would work. And the question is, you know, how do you balance things, right? How do you have duty and compassion at the same time? Um, and, and that's probably something that every organization has to deal with. Um, and how do you even have duty to, on a voluntary basis, right? That's the key. It seems to have been the key for a lot of organizations that have been successful and have been able to grow sustainably in an organic way. And so if you look at that, then someone like, like me would say, you know, if I was less compassionate or less understanding, I should say, I would just look at that guy at the farmer's market and say that this assume he was either lying to me um, or was a product of a failing educational system, which I do, and then I would be anti-government at that point. I would be anti whatever that you know person was. If you have a situation where because of the humanized predilection for color or for noticing differences uh, that are visual, if the person was African American, uh, I might, if I was white, you know, and I've been looking at articles on my social media feed about, um, who knows, who knows, right? About uh, reparations. Um, and so on and so forth, I might be inclined to create a system where uh, to, to view that interaction not as a product of a failing educational system run by my own government, uh, plus, you know, a complex system of government that almost nobody understands. I might be in a position where I would look at that interaction in a way that would make it personal. And if you're in a diverse society, you can see how Let's say, you know, there's violence. They go in front of a judge. And again, who does that judge believe? Especially under a legal system where you can't use character. Um, you know, character evidence. It has to be based on... It, the judicial determination is usually or almost always based on a determination of the facts at hand re relating to the incident, not somebody's character. Which makes sense because if, let's say, you hit somebody... 25 years ago, that doesn't really have anything to, anything to do with you hitting somebody 25 years later in a different city and so on and so forth. Um, but you can also see how that subjectivity is one of the reasons why we have separate but equal. It's one of the reasons why that's been the favored status, whether it's in, in Israel, which was originally founded as West Bank Christian, uh, Gaza Strip Muslim, Israel proper Jewish, by the way, the conflict in, uh, in regarding the Israeli uh, territories goes all the way back to World War I. The British, under, I think it was Pivo Sykes, Pico Sykes, 
uh, promised to stand land to everybody, both of my, you know, everybody in town, basically. And that gave, that led to war, um, eventually, uh, multiple times. And that goes back to colonialism, that goes back to security, that goes back to the security structure, uh, essentially failing or trying to do everything for everyone um, and not being able to. In this case, promising the same land to the same, to, to, to different people. Um, which goes all the way back to World War I. Even though the state of Israel was, wasn't even founded until 1948, I believe, the, the origins go back decades before. So um, you look at how complex everything is, and you, it, it's, it's all extremely difficult to understand, but what is understandable is why separate but equal would make, would make sense, because if you have a conflict within an extremely complex economic system, that's run on debt, that's run on therefore propaganda, that supports that debt. Um, you can see how that's, that's anti-criticism. In order to make sure that the investments continue, uh, that people, the investors stay, and people just keep making their payments to maintain that, that entire economic system. If you have that kind of a system in place, it may very well, well, may very well be that you, you favor, theoretically, a system where that same judicial de determination is simpler because now you've got, say, a Catholic judge in a privatized system, uh, arbitration system, ruling in a matter uh, before two, Catholic, two Catholics, as opposed, and, and that way you remove a lot, of the complex, a lot of the complexity we just talked about, especially in a, in a country where the edu educational system has been fragmented, especially in a country where the political system has been fragmented. So you've got this idea where you can see how in some places separate but equal was favored and why it was favored. You can also see how inherently it just doesn't work within a globalized economic system. That also explains why the East is obviously globalized, uh, but it's moving away from a naval-based system into a land-based system of trade, therefore creating its own sphere of influence. Um, you look at all these things together, and, you know, I, I kind of joke that the communists were right. They were just, you know, they were just several decades too early. And the 2008 crisis proved that. Uh, but the ability of the United States and, and the whole world that was allied with the United States to bounce back from that also proves the resiliency of the debt-led Western economic model uh, that sometimes requires war in order to protect property overseas under that naval-based system, trading system. You can see how, you know, people that have been colonized, governments that, are, that have the experience of colonization, which I would prefer to avoid war and try to create a system that may be less diverse, uh, but perhaps, you know, more simple. And that is one of the reasons why we're having so many cultural problems, because if you're not going to create a society, you know, where you are able to promise people not just economic growth, especially economic growth in a sustainable way, but at least some sort of human progress. What is the point? What is money after all? Is it just to give you a house, some shelter, some food on the table? Or is it, especially under a, a system of concentrated ownership, is it, is it a way to promote human progress? A, a battle between trading houses to see who can promote the, the best culture, the best system of life, the best way of life, the best methods? Is that what it really is? And how do you do that when security has become so expensive? And, you know, we know that we're in a position now where, you know, we're having major problems all over the world. Um, and we know that we're having communication problems which are based on, which, which you know, have sprung from informational um, fragmentation, which has now led to media consolidation. Um, and that again goes back to, you know, if you have only six or seven companies that control the news in, in, in say the United States, you know, uh, you've got a concentration of ownership throughout your entire society. What does that mean? Um, when you have also at the same time, a segregated society um, that at one point in time really believed that a more simple separate but equal uh, system was the best one, especially given all the conflicts in Europe. And furthermore, does that system make sense, you know, when it's contrasted with the more communal, 
communist system, the more communal Islamic system uh, that, again, has not had segregation as part and parcel of its economic policies. And, you know, how does that work? And, of course, the Muslim system has a financial system that does not uh, allow usury. It is a complete, it's completely opposed to this kind of a system. And that, of course, is complicated because, obviously, with the, the Saudis have with the government and everyone else, uh, you know, of course, they have shares in American banks. Um, so how does that work, really, in the end? Um, you know, the entire thing is really, really, uh, has gotten to the point where it's extremely complex, but uh, it's also understandable if you study it deeply enough. So where do you go from here in a society where the Americans are becoming more socialist while screaming louder and louder about capitalism, uh, and where the communists uh, are becoming more and more capitalist uh, in, a more, in a way that's a little bit more quiet, how is all this going to work in the end under a continued system of concentration of ownership in media, real estate, corporation, corporate shares, corporate equity, and uh, gosh knows what else. How is all that going to work in terms of human progress? It certainly explains why we're moving into uncertain times. Um, but if you want to really try to understand all these different things, the first thing you just want to look at is really economics. You want to understand, again, you know, the differences, differences between the East and the West really have to do with how to use debt and how to promote a system of, uh, and, and I guess how much influence do you want you know, real estate developers and private interests to have over, I suppose, sectors that are that, that in the past were essential and yet underpaid, like construction workers, like agricultural workers, like farmers, uh, who remain important lobbies all over the world today, including in the United States where the caucuses for the national election happen in Iowa, which is essentially a subsidiary of the farming industry, um, corn and ethanol and so on. And so how, how is all this going to come together? You know, you've got to look at it in terms of debt. You've got to look at it in terms of the cultures that arise from the use of debt. And you always want to, the only political philosophy you really want to have is equilibrium. It's how do you get as close to equilibrium as possible in order to promote a sustainable system? Um, and of course, I always throw in the underdog as well, right? Because if you have a system that's, that's you know, really based on marketing, in almost every case, whoever is being maligned um, is, being, is being maligned in a way that is unfair. Um, and so how do you, you know, that, that's I, it's why I, I instinctively always, always go for the underdog. And, you know, if, if you want to have a, a system that works, really, you also have to look at the legal system. And you really have to question whether or not the United States is going to be able to maintain its extremely complex multi-layered system. Um, and if it's not going to be able to maintain that system, what is the future of the country? Um, how, is all, how is the country going to grow? Is it going to be able to grow in a way that promotes diversity in a voluntary way? How, how is all this going to work? Um, you see how space has finally become the next frontier. Um, you know, how is that going to play out for, you know, for investments on the, within the planet Earth? Is it going to be a, a system where people colonize, say, you know, another planet um, and, you know, using superior technology and then become hostile to Earth? Um, how, what is really the future? And this is where you go into this idea of where science and math and engineering, if they get too far removed from philosophers and politics and lawyers, reasonable ones that are able to tie people together and systems together in a way that makes sense, they almost always devolve into a form of war. Because if you don't have the writers and the philosophers and the lawyers explaining things in a way that makes sense in an objective way, all of these different systems in place outside of context don't make any sense. None of them do. Within context, they make perfect sense. Debt, law, how do you grow economies, 
what culture works best for happiness, as well as security. Everything has always been a paradox. Everything has always been in contrast, in contrast to each other. And you have to be able to balance that paradox while at the same time understanding that equilibrium is the goal. And if you're going to have a system as complex as the United States in terms of law and enforcement and technology, you're going to have to maximize honesty and integrity. How do you really do that? When it's clear that a debt-based economic system probably does not prioritize any of those things, creativity, you know, honesty and integrity, how do you do that? And that's where you have fake news. That's where you have, you know, this, this very problematic system that is moving away from equilibrium at the same time that a competing system in the East is becoming more and more successful. And how, if you're in the East, how do you promote diversity so that you can promote creativity? The knock on countries like Singapore and China has been this idea that they don't promote creativity at all. And as a result, why would you want to have, live in a stable society that doesn't promote human progress or cultural progress? Um, and why would you want to do that, especially if you don't have to? And you know, China is going to have to answer that question. Uh, Singapore is going to have to answer that question. All these things are all these, you know, everyone's got problems of their own. Some are more simple, some are more complex. And you know, the question is, where do we go from here? The only answer I can give you is equilibrium. That's it, that's it.